I'm excited to let you know that I've had that conversation with Dr. Emmanuel Katangale, and we're going to start airing that next week as we prepare to hear what he has to say about the genocide in Rwanda and how those horrors can serve as a mirror that will allow the church to better see itself today. I find myself wondering if you're like me. Do you have a hard time wrapping your brain around the genocide? It's difficult for me to imagine these events and what it was like to live through them. I find in these kind of situations that well-done movies can be a great aid in understanding events that I have no direct contact with and empathizing with those who lived through them. I believe the movie Hotel Rwanda will help us with this. Today, we're going to take a look at some clips from the movie Hotel Rwanda so we can get a better sense of the reality of the genocide in Rwanda. I'll say up front that I know this movie isn't perfect. It was made by Westerners, and according to the filmmakers themselves, it was made to appeal to Western sensibilities, not to be a strict historical recreation. Now, no movie is 100% historically accurate, but Dr. Katangale references this movie in his book, Mirror to the Church, and says that it beautifully tells the story of Paul Rusesa Bagina, the manager of the Hotel de Mille Kalin. He was a Hutu who, at great risk of his own life, saved 700 Tutsis from death. I can only show some brief clips here, but I invite you to watch the full movie. It's available on Amazon Prime Video, and the link is below. Although it's not a documentary, the movie gives us a sense of the historical background of the genocide, including the white supremacist attitudes that set the stage for the killing. According to the Belgian colonists, the Tutsis are taller, are more elegant. It was the Belgians that created the division. They picked people, uh, those with uh, thinner noses, lighter skin. They used to measure the width of people's noses. The Belgians used the Tutsis to run the country. Then when they left, they left the power to the Hutus. And of course, the Hutus took uh, revenge on the elite Tutsis for years of repression. So what are you, Paul? I am Hutu. Are you a Hutu or a Tutsi? I am Tutsi. And your friend, Tutsi? No, I'm Hutu. The European colonizers from the worlds of business, government, and the church used the bad science of race to divide people of Rwanda and set the Tutsis over and against the Hutus. They reasoned, badly reasoned, that since the Tutsis looked a little more like Europeans, then they must be a superior race than the Hutus. In the last video, I discussed this in more detail and how that led to the genocide, so I encourage you to watch that video if you have not already done so, or better yet, read Emmanuel Katangale's book, Mirror to the Church. The link is below. When the European colonizers left, the Hutus rebelled against the Tutsis whom the Europeans had placed over them. When the genocide finally started, Hutus began taking, then killing, their Tutsi neighbors. The civilians leading the genocide were the Intera Hamwe, they acted in groups armed with machetes and other weapons. There was a real sense of hopelessness and powerlessness among the Tutsi minority as the Interahamwe sought out and killed over 800,000 Tutsis. There's nothing we can do. This was murder and death on a massive scale. In one extended and particularly potent sequence, Paul, the hotel manager, has left the hotel to get supplies for the hundreds of Tutsis that are sheltering there. The leader of the Interahamwe itself instructs Paul to take the river road back to the hotel. A heavy fog descends, so thick they can't even see the road. The van starts to bump and, and, and shake and he fears that they've driven off the road and might be heading for the river, so he stops the van and gets out only to trip and fall into a pile of bodies. As the fog lifts, Paul sees that the road he is on is littered with the bodies of dead Tutsis, men, women, and children, as far as he can see. 
the Interahamwe claimed the lives of 800,000 Tutsis, nearly three quarters of all the Tutsis. The remaining Tutsis were displaced on a massive scale. In response to this genocide, what did the white Westerners in Rwanda and around the world do? All the whites are leaving. They are being evacuated. But what about us? We have been abandoned. We're his peacekeepers, not his peacemakers. They left. Or they turned away. I am glad that you have shot this footage and that the world will see it. It is the only way we have a chance that people might intervene. Yeah, and if no one intervenes, it's still a good thing to show. How can they not intervene when they witness such atrocities? I think if people see this footage, they'll say, oh my God, that's horrible. And then go on eating their dinners. Before they left, and as they were leaving, and while the genocide was happening, these white Westerners focused on their own problems, namely how to leave in safety, and they insisted that the Rwandans around them focus on their own problems too, that is, on the problems of the white Westerners. In one scene that I don't have a clip for, a white Western journalist staying in the hotel after the genocide has already started calls Paul, who's desperately trying to protect his Tutsi wife and children, as well as hundreds of other Tutsis. This Westerner calls Paul to his room to fix his air conditioning because it's just too hot. The sequence of the white Westerners finally getting rescued from the hotel by UN troops is particularly poignant and its contrast of how different life is for blacks and privileged whites. Whites get armed soldiers to take them back to safety while carefully screening out black Westerners, well, screening them to make sure they're not Rwandans trying to get on the bus. One white man feels guilty about leaving a Rwandan girlfriend behind. He offers her money. The money, of course, won't help her, but it will salve his conscience a bit. Then, disturbingly telling, then a disturbingly telling scene as the bus drives away, showing sad whites as they flee for safety. In the last window, we see a man taking pictures, as if the Rwandans left behind to die are an interesting tourist spectacle. There's even room for their pet dog, just no room for the Rwandans. What did Christians do? Did they do any better? White Christians left too, with only one or two exceptions. Christians operating an orphanage came and left their Rwandan children at the hotel as they got on a bus to go to safety. The Rwandan Christians who were Hutus killed the Rwandan Christians who were Tutsi. In some cases, Tutsi sought sanctuary in the literal but not true sanctuary of the church buildings. In some instances, the pastors met the Interahamwe outside the building and begged the Interahamwe not to damage the building. The Christians were taken from the sanctuary so they could be killed outside. The Christianity given to the Rwandan people was a weak, anemic version of Christianity. It was a version of Christianity in which the categories and designations of race and partisan politics placed upon the Rwandans by the white colonists, missionaries, and pastors ran deeper than the waters of baptism and the blood of Jesus. But we must not stand in judgment over our Rwandan brothers and sisters. And we cannot, certainly not as long as our own version of Christianity makes the same sort of mistakes. Not as long as we're Americans first and Christians second. Not as long as we're Republican, Democrat, or Progressive first and Christians second. Not as long as we're Capitalist or Socialist first and Christians second. Not as long even as we're White or Black or Asian or Latinx first and Christians second. As long as our political, economic, national, or racial identities guide our thinking and behavior more than our Christian identities do, we have no room to judge. And that's why we need to see the genocide in Rwanda as a mirror so we can better see what truly defines us as Christians. No, our place is not to judge or to fix or even advise the Rwandans. Our place is to witness, to see what happened there, and to let it be a mirror to better show ourselves 
Our place is to lament what happened and our complicity in it and in the creation and maintenance of similar divisions in our own countries. And hopefully, our place will be to repent, to change our thinking and our behavior. Is that not the purpose of a mirror? When I shave, I use a mirror to see where the stubble is so I can remove it. When I put on a necktie, I look in a mirror. If the knot is crooked or the tie is too long or too short, I change it. As a church, we need to look in this mirror so that we can lament, repent, and change to let the blood of Jesus and the waters of baptism relativize all other allegiances and relationships to truly make us one as Jesus and the Father are one. This is the last of our preparatory videos. Next week, I'll share part one of my conversation with Emmanuel Katangale. I think you're going to like it. Until then, keep listening to stories and keep telling yours.